with a gentleman who so many of us know. Uh, we know that uh, he, along with Thomas Leonard, created Coachville. And I could tell you all about the incredible coach that he is, and he's an in incredible athlete. And uh, we've had the opportunity. One thing that I found uh, a, a, couple, a couple of TLCs ago is inside of the spirit of Dave lives Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I did a, I went to Chicago and, and did a presentation with Dave, and it was an incredible experience. And we were on stage together singing standards, and it truly, I, f I felt like Ella Fitzgerald and, and, uh, and Frank Sinatra. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, Mr. Dave Buck. Thank you. All right. I'm on. Wow. So six years ago, I received a vision. And I don't know what you all do when you receive a vision, but what I do is I reserve a domain name. <laughs> so I went on to, Google, to uh, GoDaddy, and I reserved inspirationeconomy.com, along with the Inspiration Economy and the Inspiration Age and about six other you know, things very similar. And so what I'm going to do with you now in the next 17 minutes and 34 seconds is share with you what I've learned about the inspiration economy in six slightly less than three minute rants. So here is rant number one. No more crap. <laughs> the inspiration, the industrial economy is based on three ideas that have gone horribly wrong. They were good ideas at the time, at about 1880, when the industrial economy started. The three ideas were more is better, cheaper is better, and faster is better. Now these are basically good ideas, and when the world needed a lot of things, they, they were good, they served us well. However, if you take these three ideas and you push them just a little too far, what you get is a lot of crap. Cheap crap, fast crap, more crap. <laughs> crap made in a way that abuses the earth, that often abuses the people that make the crap, and you just get a lot more of it. You get chicken factories, you get humans in cubicle farms, and you get junk cars. Something is wrong with this economy. It's gone too far. It's time for something new. And my theory, it's a very interesting thing. You know we're having this recession. It's not an illusion, it's real. There's a real recession happening. But my theory about the recession is this. Over the last 20 years, we've had a massive expansion of human consciousness. It's been amazing what has happened. And you all are a part of it, possibly causing it in many ways. But what happens is, as humans become more conscious, they get a much greater desire for purpose and meaning. But their desire for crap goes way down. So as people want a lot less crap, they don't buy the crap anymore, and so the economy, which is designed to make a lot of crap, goes down. So it's no big surprise that we're having a recession. You all are causing the recession, Yay. which is good. It's actually a very, very good thing. So what we need to do now is we need to create a new economy that capitalizes capitalizes, it's, a, it's the correct word, that capitalizes this huge expansion of consciousness and awareness. So that's, that's the big idea. The most important thing to take away from this point is more is not better. We basically have that idea? Yeah. All right, we're done with that one. What is better? Better is better. That's a Toyota Prius. And I will get to that in a moment. Quickly, the history of world economics in 30 seconds. There have always been four economies in the world running simultaneously. The agrarian economy, which is about producing food. The industrial economy, which is about making things. 
The service economy came about after the industrial economy for the most part because as people had more and more things, they needed to take care of all these things, so they needed services to take care of the things. And a lot of people are messing around with things so much they're not taking care of themselves, so they need services to take care of themselves because they don't have time to take care of themselves, they're messing with all their things. Now there's always been a little tiny inspiration economy from the beginning of time. The, the problem was most of the people in the inspiration economy took a vow of poverty to do so. So there wasn't a lot of money in it, okay? But this has changed. Now with this expansion of consciousness, there's a huge demand for inspiration. People are yearning for inspiration. And so it's actually possible now to make an economy based on inspiration. Because whenever there's a demand for something, an economy emerges to fulfill that demand. Make sense? So I want to tell you about how, you, how people participate in the inspiration economy. There's basically two ways. You participate in the inspiration economy either by providing inspiration and getting paid for it, or purchasing things or services or even food that inspires you. So if you purchase based on inspiration, you're participating in the inspiration economy. So I want to tell you about how I came to buy a Toyota Prius. I read a little article about this Prius. Now, I'm an earth-friendly guy. So I read this article, and I think, oh, this car sounds pretty good. So I go to the Toyota dealer. I'm in the Prius. We're driving around, and we stop at a red light. And the car stops. The engine just stops. And I'm sitting in this zen-like cone of silence. Wow. And I have a flashback. I remember, I'm 10 years old. I'm sitting in the station wagon with my mom. We're at the red light in town. It's cold. And you can see all the cars at the red lights. And you see all the fumes coming out of the exhaust pipes. And you see people on the street corners breathing in all the fumes. And I say, Mom, why do all the cars keep running when they're stopped at red lights? This is stupid. We're making all this pollution. People have to breathe it. We're wasting gas. Why is this happening? She says, I don't know, honey. That's just the way cars are made. And I said, that's just stupid. So I remember, whoa, 35 years later, somebody finally woke up and made a car that doesn't pollute when it stopped at a red light. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> I didn't ask about the price. I didn't ask about anything. Now, what's interesting about the Prius is it's not more. It's a small car. It's definitely not fast. And it's not cheap. So you get a small car for a lot of money <laughs> that doesn't go fast. <laughs> but it's smart. It's inspiring. I love sitting in my Prius. When it stops at the red light and I'm in the cone of silence, I'm in zen-like state of bliss. So you all are doing this. You are making purchases based on inspiration. So you are participating in the inspiration economy. And my theory is more and more people want to do this. All right, that one's done. <laughs> Rant number three, power to the people. I have always been a power to the people kind of guy. All right, but now this whole industrial economy and the awareness of what it's done and how it's gone too far and what's actually possible with the inspiration economy really has me fired up, in case you can't tell. In the industrial economy, human beings are seen as two things. They are seen as workers and consumers. That's all you are. You're a worker and a consumer. Your job is go to your job. You don't have to enjoy it. Just do your damn job and then make some money so that you can buy some other people's crap. That's basically how the world is set up today. Work, do your job, make some money, buy some more crap. And what's happened is people have realized that this does not make us happy. The big myth of the industrial economy is that things make you happy. But they don't make us happy. We figured this out. As humans become more conscious, we know things do not make us happy. 
in the inspiration economy, what's possible is for people to live as players, as creators. People do not want to consume more crap. What they want to do is they want to invest. They want to invest in themselves. They want to invest in their environments. They want to invest in their communities. People want to invest. They don't want to be consumers anymore. And this, you know, this explains why the current global economy based on the industrial production of things is going down because people don't want to buy so many things. How big of a TV do you really need? I mean, we don't need any more crap. So what people are yearning to do is they're yearning to express their talents and their gifts in a way that adds value to community. They want to buy things, but they want to buy things and services that inspire them, that actually enable them to create better. They want to create better. This is what humans are yearning to do. And that's what the inspiration economy is all about. The pursuit of purpose, oh, that's rant number three, is done. Rant number four. The pursuit of purpose and the escape from project prison. We'll get to the project prison part in a moment. But first, purpose. Humans, as they expand in consciousness, what they yearn for more than anything else is a purpose-centered life. Humans are yearning for purpose. And in my experience as a coach for 13 years, purpose, when people pursue purpose, what they pursue first is human greatness. Human greatness is when you play the game of your life so well that it actually inspires others. It's human greatness. It's not personal greatness. It's human greatness. People are yearning to express their human greatness and raise up the game of life for everyone around them. In order to uh, pursue human greatness, you need support and challenge. You need both. There's always a dynamic between support and challenge. We talked about this a little bit yesterday with superconductivity. The second thing is the flow state, also a part of being superconductive. You want, humans want to be in the flow. When you start pursuing your purpose, you look to get your energy aligned. You want to think and feel and act in a way that's in the flow. And in order to get into the flow, you actually need two things. You need someone to perturb your energy, and you also need to, then you need to get your energy aligned, because every time you play a bigger game, you actually perturb your energy, and then you have to get back into alignment in the bigger game. And this is what happens when you pursue purpose. You also um, want to pursue personal evolution. Personal evolution is where you design environments that cause you to grow. And when you're pursuing purpose, you want to grow. You don't want to stand stagnant. You want to grow. You want to evolve. And that's what per personal evolution is. And you have a few other things. Really, when you start pursuing purpose, you get actively involved in pursuing mastery, in being conscious about sustainability, and also you grow in awareness. And so as humans are becoming more aware and more conscious, this is what they're interested in. Less crap, more purpose. Project prison. This is a big idea. Does anyone recognize these people? <laughs> this is what happens. In the industrial economy, it was all about projects. Everyone's on a project. Our romances are projects. Our families are projects. Work is a project. Our business is projects. Our health is a project. Everything is a project. The problem with projects is every project has one thing in common, a dead line. <laughs> and when you are in pursuit of a dead line, there's only one way it can turn out, Die. stress, anxiety, and dead. There's nothing inherently wrong with projects, except if your whole life is projects, you, what happens is when you're in pursuit of a project, at first you're excited, oh, I have a new project. And then by the second or third day of your project, I can guarantee you something goes wrong, and now you're stressed because you're not going to make it to your deadline. And everything that goes wrong actually throws you off balance. But the thing about life is things are always going wrong. 
The whole myth of the industrial economy and project life is that we can control everything step by step by step and get there. But life doesn't work like that. The whole no notion of it is antithetical to the way life really is. Life is full of surprises. Project life hates surprises. So what we need is a way of living that actually includes surprises and actually embraces surprises and loves surprises. And that way of living is the spirit of play. The spirit of play, when you are a player, you love surprises because every surprise makes you more resourceful, more creative, more resilient. In the spirit of play, you're engaged. You enjoy what you're doing. It's the spirit of play in my experience, and I know you know these people. It's the way Tiger Woods plays golf. It's the way Oprah plays media. It's the way President Obama plays leadership, or Maya Angelou plays poetry. This is the spirit of play. It's a sense of expression of who you really are and bringing your greatness into every moment. This is what the spirit of play is all about, and this is what conscious, aware human beings are yearning for, is this spirit of play. The good news is humans are born to play. We are born to play. We play from the earliest days. What happens is the industrial way of life, project, task, get it done, it takes the play out of us. If we can bring back the spirit of play, we can actually capitalize on this expanded consciousness and bring it to life in a way that we can truly build a new world. The good thing for me, and I, knew you know, I know you knew there was a coaching angle to this presentation. The coaching angle is the spirit of play is beautiful because when you want to play a big game in life, a better game in life, the one thing you need more than anything else is a great coach. And great coaching is about teaching individuals or teams to play better a big game in life and win on their own terms. That's what coaches do. So the inspiration economy is about players and coaches in communities. That's what it's all about. The agrarian economy, we had farmers on farms, we had workers in factories, workers in cubicles. In the inspiration economy, we have players and coaches in communities, adding value to each other, inspiring each other. That's what the new world is all about. Inspiration economy business, very quickly, in order to be in business in the inspiration economy, that you have to be more conscious. What happens is you have to transition industrial economy businesses, market, inspiration economy business, businesses, you go for visibility. But to be visible, you have to be willing to be seen. It's a challenge to your consciousness to be willing to be seen. To transition from selling to engaging people, you have to be willing to be known. This requires expanded consciousness. To go from delivering your, your crap to fulfilling your purpose, you have to be worthy of feeling fulfilled. You have to shift from managing to orchestrating. You have to be willing to connect. You have to shift from a focus on money to a focus on wealth. Wealth is the accumulation of value. It's whatever you value. It could be character, could be love, could be health. Whatever you value, this is what you will pursue in the inspiration economy. So, in my last 13 seconds, I want to thank you for listening to this series of rants, and I want to invite you to participate in the Inspiration Economy website, which is launching as we speak. And what we would love to do is collect your Inspiration Economy stories, either how you are providing inspiration, how you're making purchases based on inspiration, how you're living a life of inspiration. I would love every one of you to share your inspiration economy story with me so we can put it on the, on the website and share it with the world. We can build a new world with the spirit of play, and together we can make it happen. Thank you so much.